The year is 1931. For the flappers of last week's episode, and for nearly everyone else, the party is officially over. And they look back longingly at the years before the crash of 29. The years before it all went to hell. But as crap as things are, the drum of progress beats resolutely on in the form of an extraordinary new skyscraper that is completed in New York City. For nearly four decades, it will be the tallest building in the world. But even though the Empire State Building has since been surpassed in height, it remains an iconic structure and a prime example of Art Deco architecture. Now, if you're like me, you've heard over and over and over about this Art Deco, and it always raises a couple of compelling questions. Number one, who was Art Deco? And number two, what did he do that was so special? And we'll talk about it on the other side. You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, 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 oh. You know, I just breathed kind of a silent prayer. Because <laughs> I feel as though I might be in just a little bit over my head on this one. Sometimes when you do histories, most of the time, I'm dealing with something that is linear, something that is fairly well-defined, a story that has a beginning, a middle, an end, an origin, perhaps a legacy. <laughs> and then sometimes you get into something that is way less linear and a little bit more amorphous, shall we say, and it doesn't necessarily add up in a nice convenient package. And that's where I'm in right now. I'm looking at Art Deco. And what I found out in my travels is that Art Deco was a designer from Queens, New York, okay? And he came up with the concept of, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm a kid there. Art Deco was not a guy. There's probably a guy called Art Deco. Art Deco in popular memory, not a guy, all right? Art Deco was a movement, and it was not even about art per se, in terms of fine art, but more about design. Now, the term Art Deco came into prominence in and around 1925, okay? Courtesy of the Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs et Industriels Modernes. <laughs> Mine uh, Franzosisch is not so great, my pronunciation. The International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts in Paris, 1925. Now, this is important already, okay? Modern decorative and industrial arts. We are not talking about fine art here, okay? When we're talking about Art Deco, we're talking about design of things far beyond fine art. Furniture, products, carpets, wallpaper. This is a much, much, much broader and much different thing. And in order to understand it, as with so many other movements, I think you got to go back in time, all right? And in this case, we're going back into the 1800s, okay? Into some territory, onto some ground that we have traversed on other episodes, okay? And we're going back again and looking at what became this perpetual conflict, this perpetual battle between traditionalists and modernists in all facets of the art world, and eventually into facets of lifestyle, etc., and products. And that's where we're going with this, okay? So let's go back and look. 1800s, we have talked about this before. Remember the episode number 103, Riot at the Ballet, which was about the riot that occurred in 1913 
at the premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, when the traditionalists and the modernists came to blows over this insane new style of dance and music that the traditionalists hated and the modernists loved. And they came to blows. This was a culmination. This was a hot war (laughs) born out of a cold war that had gone on for decades between old and new. And in the 1800s, there's a lot of new, okay? New technology, industrial revolution, new materials, new ideas, people moving into cities, enormous, enormous change, okay? This change presented itself in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different places. I am taking us, as this is a superficial history, we are going to the Art Nouveau movement, okay? This is a precursor to what would become Art Deco, all right? Now, Art Nouveau, we're talking about 1880s to around early 1900s, and it is exactly what the title says, okay? Art Nouveau, new art. This is modernists, you know, coming to the fore, as we have seen, we have seen many examples of this, in reaction to what has gone before, in reaction to traditionalism. In terms of art, in terms of design, we have this new group of people who are looking at this modern world, which is all about progress. We talked last week about this idea late 1800s into early 1900s of this pinnacle of civilization, right? Like, look at all this new stuff we got. Remember the Eiffel Tower? The Eiffel Tower being erected in 1887, at the time, the tallest freaking thing ever, and it was made out of iron. This is progress exemplified, and it's being built for the World's Fair in Paris, right? And we look at the Eiffel Tower now as this incredible romantic, wonderful, world-renowned symbol of Paris. But at the time, if you remember our episode, people hated the Eiffel Tower. Again, these traditionalists, and these people who rose up to say, how dare you put this blight, this awful eyesore, on our beautiful Paris? How can you do this to us? All right, this was a symbol of the modern age, and it caused controversy and consternation. So you have these people, these artists, painters, sculptors, architects, artisans, okay? And they're living in this time where there's a perceived optimism and progress and all of this stuff happening. And what they're looking at around them in the art world, in the architecture world, is styles that harken back to the old days. It is all about the past neoclassicism (laughs) and Greek revival. These styles in art, you look at neoclassicist paintings from the 1700s, 1800s, they're all throwbacks. They look like Renaissance paintings. And there is this focus on kind of rediscovering antiquity because there's been discoveries. Like in the old world, they're starting to unearth Pompeii and things like that. And so there's this renewed interest in antiquity, in Roman history, in Greek history, and that becomes the flavor of the times. We're going to recreate that kind of art and style. And this is very, very popular in the 1700s and the 1800s, okay? But as the Industrial Revolution kicks in and we are being shuttled into much more modern thinking, much more modern ways of living, good or bad, There are artists who say, we want to develop a new style. Enough with this classicism, neoclassicism, I mean. Enough with Greek revival. Enough with buildings that look Greek from 2,000 years ago. Enough with columns. Enough with paintings that look Renaissance. Enough with all of this art that is nothing but a throwback. All of this stuff that looks backwards. We're about the modern age. We are about progress in the future. Stop looking backwards, okay? But the world, the established art world, let's say, is very much rooted in this neoclassicist, in this style of art 
that looks backwards. And there's a conflict brewing. We talked about the Impressionists. Remember this, this all goes back again to episode 103. The Impressionists who come along and they look at these, these paintings that are popular, that are based on myth, that are based on Roman history, that are based on the Bible. They look Renaissance and they do something utterly different. They come along and they begin painting impressions of things. And the brush strokes are visible. And we're not talking about realism here. We're talking about an emotional sense of art. Emotion depicted. Not events, not people per se, but emotions expressed. And playing with light and trying to capture real reality in a perceptive kind of way. As opposed to a very linear, as opposed to a picture of a thing. An impression of a thing as opposed to a picture of a thing. And that's very modern at the time, 1870s, 1880s. And people lose their freaking minds. (laughs) Because this isn't art. You know, the traditionalists don't dig on this newfangled style. This conflict is happening, and we've talked about it before. And so there are movements happening in every country everywhere, which is a pulling away from neoclassicism, a pulling away from the traditional way of doing things, an embrace of progress, modernity, modernism. And there are any number of places you can point to as the evidence of this. But for our purposes here, we're going to go into Austria, okay? Into the most beautiful city that I've ever seen, that I long to return to, the magnificent Vienna. And there's a group of artists, architects, sculptors, painters, kicking around Vienna, who have had it with the status quo. They have had it with the establishment, and they want to refocus Austrian art and design into the modern age, all right? Into this new art, this art nouveau. They want to pull it in that way, and they're meeting resistance everywhere they go. And they are names that you may recognize, okay? Names like Joseph Hoffman and Joseph Maria Ulrich, the architects. And if you don't know them, perhaps you know the painter Gustav Klimt. And you may not think you know Gustav Klimt, but if you have ever attended a print sale or a poster sale on a university campus, (laughs) you know Gustav Klimt because you know his painting, The Kiss. Go look it up if you can't bring this to mind. This is a very, very, very famous canvas. And it was painted 1907, 1908. And it's a couple in embrace. The woman is on her knees. And the man is sort of looming over her. And he's kissing her. But he is shrouded in like a cloak. And her, she's kneeling on the grass. So you've got these really bright green colors with flowers on the ground. And they are both shrouded in this kind of yellow, cloaky, it's almost abstract. It's a very strange, it's most definitely not a Renaissance painting when you look at it. And it's got like gold leaf on it, yellow, lots of colors, lots of shapes. And the man is like kissing her and it's called The Kiss. And you've seen it. You've seen it in every university residence since it was created in 1907. Go look up. The Kiss, that is Gustav Klimt. That was at the time a very modern style of painting. And Klimt was one of the people who were at the forefront of this Art Nouveau movement, all right? And so it comes to a head. The modernists are struggling to get through to the Association of Austrian Artists who want and favor and support this traditional style of doing it all And eventually they just break away and they form what they call the Vienna Secession. All right, this is 1897. Hoffman, Ulbrich, Klimt, several other high profile architects, sculptors, and painters, etc., designers, artisans, they break away and they form the Vienna Secession. And their whole game is we're doing the new art now. All right, you can keep your establishment. We're breaking off. We're doing our own thing. And one of the first things that they do in reaction 
to this neoclassicist style, to this emphasis on historicism in architecture, in design, in painting, etc. Historicism, we're not doing that anymore. We don't care about Pompeii. We're doing the new thing. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a building that is going to house this art that we're doing. And so they build what they called the Secession Building. It was erected 1898, and it was a home for all of this new style of art, okay? And this art is a breakaway. It's a breakaway from the neoclassical historical stuff, which is, you know, columns. Think of Greek buildings, ancient Roman buildings, very square columns, very ornate, etc. It's like, we're not doing that anymore. And so they build this really weird thing. They build this really weird thing called the Secession Building. And you look at it and it's like, that's strange. Go look at pictures. It's kind of a squat building. It is not, there's no columns. I'll tell you right now, there's no columns. And then at the top, there's like this big sphere and it's covered in gold leaves. And this became one of the themes of the Art Nouveau movement. They, they were living in this very industrialized society. The Industrial Revolution is happening. Mass production is happening. And they're saying, let's break away from all of that stuff. Let's return, in a sense, to nature. So the Art Nouveau movement has a lot of nature happening, a lot of asymmetries appearing. And it's built around like vines and flowers and these kind of, in terms of design and architecture, these like wavy curved lines getting away from, if you think of an ancient kind of neoclassical style building, a lot of columns, a lot of up and down kind of structure, very straight, very solid, right? And this neoclassicism thing was happening everywhere. There's a lot of buildings in the States, famous buildings like the Capitol building, like the White House, where you look at it and it's all columns. You know, this is neoclassical architecture, very straight, very rigid, right? And it had to be in those days, otherwise stuff would fall down. <laughs> Art Nouveau says, let's get away from that. Let's get into curved lines, sensual kinds of lines. And let's pay homage to nature, all right? So we're going to have a lot of leaves and flowers, and we're going to have animals, and we are going to adopt these themes into our work, all right? And it's not just going to be painting, and it's not just going to be sculpting, all right? Art for us goes well beyond these traditional definitions. And so if you are a furniture maker, if you are a jewelry maker, if you make carpets, if you are an artisan of any stripe, you are considered an artist, all right? And this comes out of what was called the arts and crafts movement, which was happening in Britain at roughly the same time. So you had like these textile workers and these people who make cool stuff that is not painting or sculpture, and they're doing so in poverty, and they're not getting the kind of respect that they deserve. And so the Art Nouveau movement exemplified by the Vienna Secession, says, hey, all of these artisans are artists too, and let's put some respect on them, shall we? And so all these people became part of the Art Nouveau movement as well. This is not so much about art as it was about design, and that will eventually inform what becomes Art Deco, okay? The other thing that's going on, and this is a head-scratcher to me, there's a lot of contradiction in all of this. And one of the things that makes this such a hard topic to cover in a superficial history is that it's hard to define what's what. So the Art Nouveau movement is in some ways a backlash to the Industrial Revolution. And we don't like these machines per se, and we don't like this kind of mass production. You know, one of the hallmarks of this movement is the notion, again, of the craftsman, the craftsperson. And so we put an emphasis not on mass-produced stuff, but on individual stuff, all right? The unique art that an expert craftsperson can do. And that becomes very expensive, by the way. <laughs> becomes very, very expensive to get 
that cool Art Nouveau furniture because it's bespoke. It is individual. A lot of the stuff is one-off, all right? And you've got to hire a cat who is capable of doing it, who has an individual style that you like, to do it for you. And so it becomes, in certain senses, play stuff for the very, very wealthy. Well, there's a lot of very, very wealthy going around in these days, okay? And a lot of people got a lot of money, and they want the new stuff, too. And so it becomes associated, Art Deco as well, with a lot of wealth, all right? And we're using exotic materials, particularly when we get to Art Deco. But while we're rejecting, in certain ways, the Industrial Revolution, we are embracing new materials, all right? So concrete, and so steel, and aluminum. And the Art Nouveau movement is embracing some of this stuff and beginning to use it, all right? And you see some of this beginning to appear, appear in the secession building. Now, what I'm pointing to, a couple of things that I want to get to with the Vienna Secession, one of which is on the original secession building. It was eventually destroyed in World War II, okay, and then rebuilt. But there was a motto that was inscribed on the front face of the building, all right? And the motto was, Der Zeit ihrer Kunst, der Kunst ihrer Freiheit. What on earth does that? My German pronunciation is getting better. What it says is, to every age, it's art. To every art, it's freedom. This was, the building was established as a manifesto, okay? And then there was a manifesto printed upon it, all right? To every age, it's art. Away with the art of previous ages, all right? And to every art... It's freedom. Stop putting restrictions on what we're trying to do. Stop putting rules on our expression. Stop blocking us, Jack, from doing this and from establishing an art for our time. All right? The reason I go to the Vienna Secession is because of this statement. To every age, it's art. To every art, it's freedom. This became kind of the heart and soul of the Art Nouveau thing. And then the second part is that they wanted to pull in artisans of every stripe, all right? Borrowing from the arts and craft movement in Britain, which said, put respect on these artisans. Same thing was happening in other places. We want to create what they called a total art, a philosophy of art that is not about art as much as about design. And we want that design to be modern. We don't want it to align so much with what has come before. And so the hallmarks of Art Nouveau are these curved lines, all right, and this use of new materials and floral patterns and this kind of earthy color palette, right? Browns, oranges, greens, these are earthy kinds of tones and somewhat muted and used in a way that has not been used before, all right? And you get these patterns happening And it's an utterly new way of doing things, but not just painting, buildings, furniture, carpets. All right, this is a total art. We're blurring the lines here. And I find that really, really compelling because this is the beginning of product design being an art unto itself. You know what I mean? I find this to be a very, very modern freaking concept. You know, the painters and the sculptors were so elevated for so long. It was like, what about all these other people who are building really cool furniture, right? Or really cool quilts or whatever. It's like, look at this art too. Let's stop being so snobby about this. Let's embrace and incorporate a design style and attitude that embraces all of this. I find this very modern. And yet in some ways it's a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. And it's a head scratcher for me and I have trouble getting my brain around it. Let's fast forward, okay? Because this is also happening in France. France remains, you know, at this point in time, the heart of so much. Culturally, fashion, art, whatever. You know, France is always on the leading edge and they're embracing this notion too. And they are embracing this Art Nouveau as well. So what they want to do is, remember, In our previous episode, 103, we talked about the Salon de Paris, and this was a time-honored tradition where they would have a salon or an exhibit 
of all the current art, right? And the Impressionists back in the day had trouble getting their paintings into the Salon de Paris. Too modern. We don't like it. Let's go back and look at this stuff that might have come from the Sistine Chapel, you know? We talked about this before. And so it was with the artisans. Couldn't get into the Salon de Paris. They wouldn't accept it. You know, and then eventually, okay, we'll let some of you come, but we're going to stick you over in a corner. Because it's all about the painting, man. It's all about the sculpture. We'll put you over there as kind of a sideshow. And if people are interested, they'll come look, all right. Eventually, we get the Society of Decorative Arts formed 1901-ish, all right? And they're like, we're going to have our own salon, all right? We're going to have our own freaking thing. It's kind of like the Vienna Secession and those cats building their own building. And what we're going to do is we're going to put our stuff in there and you can come look at it, maybe come buy it. And they would put Impressionist paintings in there. Just anything modern is coming in to our Secession building. It's our little gallery. You can come and look at it, all right? So the Society of Decorative Artists does the same thing. 1901, they're formed. We're pulling in all of these artisans. This is the new art. And we want to have our own salon, all right? And so eventually, like 10 years later, all right, this is, my, my timelines are wonky. This is a formed in 1901. Several years later, they're like, let's just have our own freaking salon. We'll just do it ourselves. And so what they wanted to do is have this big exhibit. They got together in 1912 and said, all right, 1915, we're having the salon for the new art. All right. Going to come look at some cool chairs and some cool carpets and yeah, some painting. And you're going to come and look at some glasswork. And you're going to come and look at like screens and stuff and wallpaper. It's going to be freaking cool. And it's all modern. All right. Nothing that throws back to anything. All modern stuff. We're going to do that in 1915. Yee-haw. But then what happens, kids? What happens before 1915? 1914 and the outbreak of World War I. Can't have a salon now. We're a little busy. And so the salon gets put on hold, right? And then the war eventually ends. The Society of Decorative Artists kind of reconvenes. It's like, all right, 1922, we'll have our big salon that we were supposed to have like eight years ago. But it gets delayed and there are problems and we can't invite the Germans. And so it gets pushed off until 1925. All right, this is what I already talked about way back in the beginning. 1925 Paris, the International Exhibition of Modern Decorative Industrial Arts, from which we get the term Art Deco. Okay, now this is happening, you know, 20 years after this society forms. You know, we're way behind schedule on getting this stuff out here. All right, now it began as kind of an Art Nouveau thing, but a lot changes in 25 freaking years. We know that, man. We know that. In the year 2000, or 1998, weren't nobody on Instagram. You know what I mean? A lot changes in 25 freaking years. And in the interim, this Art Nouveau thing has evolved. You could call it an evolution. You could call it an outright rejection. It depends on which way you're looking at it. But this stuff continues to evolve, all right? And so by the time we get to 1925, this new concept of Art Deco, in terms of style, in terms of design, is coming into vogue. And that is just the product of evolution, all right? Art Nouveau starts this for me, with this notion of breaking with past tradition and doing different sort of lines, different symmetries, floral prints, different sorts of colors, breaking from the tradition, pulling in this respect for artisans, and then it evolves in the interim, all right, between 1901 and 1925 when they finally get around to having their exhibit, right? Because other movements have begun to take shape in the interim. We've talked about some of this too, okay? New materials in terms of architecture are really coming into vogue, one of which, vitally important, is reinforced concrete. Now, they've begun to make buildings with this stuff, which does pretty cool things like allow you to build bigger, allow you to build higher, right, than structures we've had in the past. It allows you to create different kinds of lines. And 
it's really fun for me, and I was not expecting this in my extensive research on this topic. It was a great surprise and a delightful one to me to find out that one of the very first and most prominent structures to be built in Paris out of reinforced concrete was no less than the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées. Is that twigging any memories for you kids? That building was completed in 1913 just in time to house what event? The premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, where the freaking riot happened. Whoa! The threads of history and the threads of this program just combine in such exciting and compelling ways. The Théâtre des Champs-Élysées is an example of this, all right? It's made of reinforced concrete. And you look at it and it's like, it's not a building that particularly stands out necessarily. When it was constructed, it was thought to be pretty bland, but that was kind of the idea. You know, there was not a lot of ornamentation. The visual appeal of the building, it was fairly simple, but there are like inset rectangles and stuff. And this is becoming part of what would become the Art Deco movement, all right? The people who really designed under Art Deco were also influenced by Cubism. We talked about Cubism and Picasso and this notion of art that breaks things down into its geometrical foundations. You see a lot of cylinders. You see a lot of triangles. If you look at Cubist paintings, they're almost surreal and they're very weird and they use shapes, very defined shapes, as the structure of things to imply movement, to imply time passing. This is all very, very new. And there is a style of painting called Fauvism. And Fauvism is all about just wild colors and Orphism. These new styles of painting, you know, in the 1900s, 1910s to 20s, these new styles of painting that are all about really big, bold, exciting, sometimes clashing colors. And it doesn't have to be real, all right? A lot of this painting was a shift away from realism that had started with Impressionism. It was a new style of painting that was not about painting a picture of a freaking thing. Now we're reinterpreting things. And so you might have a Fauvist painting, which is just, there's like a woman, and then there's just splotches of color everywhere running together, and her face might be green or it might be blue, or there might be a picture of a cityscape where the sky is purple, or the buildings are orange. Again, it's a kind of impressionism. It's you, the painter, presenting the colors the way you would like to see them. It, there's no, it's not realism. It's almost cartoonish. And then you begin to see posters emerging for plays or whatever. You know, this, this whole Art Deco thing took over design of everything, right? From posters to the interiors of trains. Like it was a pervasive kind of thing, all right? But we begin to see these things opening up in the interim between 1901 and 1925, all right? So cubism, fauvism, orphism, new emphasis on geometric shapes, on bigger, bolder, brighter colors than we saw in the Art Nouveau movement. It's like amplifying a lot of this stuff, right? And so what would become Art Deco becomes very, very concerned with these kind of straight lines, very stylized structures, stuff that is not particularly ornate or is ornate in little bursts. But even that sort of stuff is stylized and big colors. You know, it's not just the Théâtre de Champs-Élysées itself. The productions of the Ballet Russe, who put on the Rite of Spring, and Stravinsky's other productions, the Ballet Russe was famous for its really exotic, bold, colorful sets by Leon Bakst. You know, and we've already talked about how wild those productions were with Nijinsky's choreography and Stravinsky's music that was inscrutable and the choreography was wild, very modern. A lot of backlash to it. There was backlash to the Théâtre de Champs-Élysées as an edifice. People thought it was boring. People thought it was weird. But it was the example of this new style of architecture 
not a lot of ornamentation, but a lot of design, right? A lot of rectangles, a lot of symmetry, windows, aluminum, using new materials, right? And this appears in the craftsmanship as well. And it's an extension, I think, of this whole Art Nouveau focus on the craftsmanship and the craftsperson. So Art Deco, they were making stuff out of ivory and ebony and platinum and jade, very exotic materials, very expensive materials. And, you know, department stores, it's, you know, you're always trying to get people to buy the stuff, right? So department stores are hiring designers <laughs> to build individual stuff. You know, they have an army of designers. You want this sort of thing? You go to that department store because their designers are the ones making it. And they're making it out of freaking jade. And this whole new style of design comes in. And I find it interesting because it's so modern in the sense that we're using art and a philosophy of art for product design. I think this begins there and then it goes all the way up to the freaking iPhone. You know what I mean? This kind of user experience. Really, really interesting. And I don't even understand it. I don't even understand it. But through fauvism, cubism, there's this new emphasis on geometry, right? And they're using new materials like aluminum and reinforced concrete and steel to be able to make things in the ways that we couldn't make them before. And how freaking modern is this, right? The new age, the new stuff, the new material. And you see that in the Théâtre de Champs-Élysées. And you see it in the sets for the Ballet Russe. This whole new design ethic, this new design ethos, this new freaking style, which is supplanting Art Nouveau, taking it to new directions. Art décoratif, the decorators, the decorative stuff. And it's freaking expensive, all right? For the first, you know, up until the Depression... The first 20, 30 years of this Art Deco thing that hasn't even been defined yet is associated with luxury, all right? Because the materials are so expensive, the stuff is individually crafted, jewelry with jade in it, you know? Very, very expensive, very associated with luxury, and kind of the upper classes, and I don't know, maybe there's some consternation there too. Very stylized, very floral. Okay, there's still this emphasis on floral patterns and kind of earthy stuff, but it's not representative. All right? It is not a picture. It's very stylized, very sleek, very modern, and it continues in decoration. So you walk into building, you know, the lobbies are marble, right? There's these patterns everywhere, zigzaggy patterns. And it becomes associated with anything that's exotic, all right? Ocean liners, cruises, you know, you walk onto the ship and it is laid out, Art Deco, very exotic, very modern looking, right? Trains, whatever. And it becomes, while it's exotic and elevated and expensive, it's interesting because it becomes, you know, the design associated with commercial buildings and government offices, you know, and the post office, and city hall, and department stores. This is very, for me, it's very proletarian. And we're not reserving this style of art. is not reserved for galleries. It is not reserved for churches, right? It is not reserved, per se, for the homes of the wealthy or the power brokers. This is an accessible art. This is an accessible art for nearly everyone. Even if you can't afford a custom bespoke Art Deco chair designed and created by a specific person, you can enter into the post office <laughs> and participate in this design, whether you like it or not, or whether you even notice it. It becomes a very, in my mind, it becomes a very proletarian thing. And it's about design and it's about products. We call it, they call it art deco, but it's, it's about the deco, not about the art. It's about the decoration, the decorative. And I find this really freaking fascinating. And so if you look at what's considered, particularly in architecture, art deco architecture, this is what you begin to see is these 
buildings that are straight. You know, this is this is a reaction a little bit to Art Nouveau, which is very curvy, very sinewy, very sensual. Art Deco tends to be more straight, I think. I mean, let's look at the Empire State Building, this, which is held up as this great example of it. At the Empire State Building, if you look at it, it's just a big spire, really. It's like a wedding cake. It's like the layers get sort of set back. They call these like setback layers. And the layers go up, 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 and up. But if you look at it, there's not a whole lot of design feature in terms of ornamentation. The design features are in the functionality, I guess, of the building itself. I don't articulate this well. I'm not an architectural or art historian. But if you look at it, it's not overt. It looks freaking cool. It's tall. It's rectangle. It's got these layers to it. And the design is in kind of the windows, the rectangles, the geometric shapes. It looks freaking cool. And this is a steel frame building. Very, very modern. All right, the exterior is limestone. And if you look at the main entrance, you see the first five or so floors are the foundation of this thing, right? And it's like a squat kind of square thing. And then the setback layers go up and up and up and up from it, 102 stories or something like that. You look at it and there's two big columns, all right, above the front entrance. Not Greek necessarily, but two big columns, right? And at the top of those columns, there are eagles. And that's a throwback, right? Art Nouveau, nature, animals. Art Deco picked up on that too. And the eagles, though, are very, very stylized. They look freaking cool. They do not look classical. They are very, very stylized. And then between those two columns, there's just like three stories up three columns of glass, plate glass, very Art Deco, very new, man, very strong. And if you zoom in on that, you'll see that the plate glass, they have inset diagonals. I'm not sure what this is made of, but there's these geometric shapes, a lot of diagonals, and they are symmetrical, all right? They match each other. And that is also a very Art Deco thing. So not this extreme ornamentation, but these designs, these geometric shapes housed within the windows. And then the whole front facade of that section of the building is just rectangle windows, all right? And I think they were set in like steel window frames, which is also a very new thing to do. And it's not a lot of ornamentation. It is a lot of geometric shape. And the geometric shapes in the windows and in those three columns of glass give it its look and vibe. They give it its design, right? And then set back layers like a wedding cake all the way up, 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 up. This is something that through using modern materials they were able to do. And the construction of skyscrapers just blows my freaking mind. Like just accommodating wind. Like, this is the 30s where they're building this stuff, and they're hip to it, right? So they're using these new materials, and they're building this very linear, very angular. That's also a trait of Art Deco to have this angles, shapes, triangles. And then you go inside the lobby, and if you look at the floor, zigzag patterns. And this is true of all of your Art Deco buildings from that time. A lot of opulence in a weird way inside. Because it'd be marble. There'd be these interesting symmetrical patterns on the floor. It wasn't just office buildings. It wasn't just government buildings. Movie palaces. <laughs> you think of movie palaces from the 1920s, 1930, maybe, maybe less so in the 30s, 1920s. Like these beautiful theaters, right? With these really interesting modern interior design modern furniture. This is all, as I understand it, Art Deco stuff, all right? This emphasis on bright colors, sometimes clashing colors. You'll see this in a lot of Art Deco stuff. And these geometric shapes and designs inside the main floor, the lobby of the Empire State Building, there is a relief of 
the building itself. All right, on the wall, you'll see the building. And at the top of the building is the sun, and then the sun rays are coming down around the building in just these straight, diagonal, symmetrical lines. And this is really expressive of the Art Deco style. And it was everywhere at the time. This was the new art. And it was in these really sleekly designed products like a freaking vacuum cleaner. This is not high art anymore. All right. This is one of the other distinctions, I guess. This is not about painting per se. This is about designing products to have this sleek, modern, new, really, really stylized vibe. And all this stuff looks really freaking cool. And I love it. I love walking into a building from the 30s where you go into the lobby and it just seems very kind of grandiose is the wrong word. All right. The neoclassicist stuff was grandiose. Big columns, big sculptures, big ornamentation, very grandiose. This is that in a different way. It's so freaking hip and modern and cool. And I love that. And it transports me to a place in time, you know, which was not the reality for everyone who lived there. Same as everybody weren't a flapper and not everybody, you know, enjoyed the high life in that way. And not everybody could participate and buy Art Deco products, at least in the early days of the movement. Right. But I love walking into a building like that and feeling as though I'm in the 1920s and everything feels so freaking classy. <laughs> Everything seems classy. Everything seems cool. Everything has this weird charisma to it. Very, very freaking cool. And I really, really like it. You know, things changed after the crash. All right. Pre-crash, people had a lot of freaking money. They could afford to buy some of them this bespoke custom Art Deco stuff. These products, this furniture these tapestries, these carpets, this wallpaper, this jewelry, whatever, they could afford to buy it. After the crash, not so much money going around, man. And so Art Deco shifts, though, in its philosophy. You know, we had been not so much into mass production, but now not so much money around. Maybe we can begin to engage that. And so Art Deco products begin to be, you know, made of plastic and stuff like this. But the design concepts remain, right? This ethic, this idea of using color and being very sleek and modern and streamlined looking, right? Like trains, like boats, very, I don't know, almost aerodynamic in a weird way. It seems it's the future. You know, futurism was a part of this too. Even though we're looking at it in retrospect now, at the time, this was all very forward thinking. And I just think the Art Deco stuff is really, really cool. And it did not survive past the war. Right? After 1945, things changed. I guess it was played out a little bit. And new styles came along. And new philosophies came along. And we're not going into that right now because I ain't looked at it yet. But this Art Deco period, the buildings are all still around. They're buildings, if you live in a city of any substantial size, Take a look at buildings that were done in the 20s or 30s, and you will find Art Deco style there. And I still don't get it. One of the reasons that this episode is particularly hard for me to do is the lines are so blurry. And Art Deco covers everything. All right, we're not talking about a style of painting, a la Cubism or Impressionism. Although, you know, those styles of painting have wider implications and influence and are influenced by other stuff that's going on. Art Deco is a philosophy of design, and it covers everything from the 100-story skyscraper to the vacuum cleaner you just bought. But I find it all very, very fascinating. It's very hard for me to put perimeters around it, because some people say it's a reaction to Art Nouveau. Other people say it's an extension of Art Nouveau. And a lot of the people who came along and started the Art Nouveau movement, continued to be active and merge into the Art Deco thing as well. So for me, it's really, really tough to put lines around it. All this to say, isn't the Empire State Building cool? <laughs> and it freaking is, man. And I just love 
that I'm going through this research and all of a sudden I find myself back at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées in 1913. Who to thunk? I mean, I thought that was a separate thing. It ties in with notions of modernism, etc. But for that to be basically the first reinforced concrete structure in Paris and to be built kind of in the Art Deco style, the first evidence of this, the first example of this, and for that to throw back so beautifully to a past episode, it's just fun, man. That's kind of symmetry all in its own. So Art Nouveau, Art Deco, back to the 20s, man. You know, I just find this whole period of time exceptionally fascinating. And I think it's fascinating for me because it's still so long ago. And it seems in a way quaint to us because the technological revolution that's happening right now and it's been happening for the last 40 years, and how that has informed our lives seems way less cool to me. Maybe, you know, somebody like me in 40 years or 50 years will look back at this and see how quaint that is when they're just thinking a thought and it gets beamed to everybody else on earth who's plugged into them on that brain-based social media network. I don't know, maybe they'll think all of this is kind of quaint. Hey, podcasts, how fun is that? I look back at the 20s, I look back at the this whole period of time and these new notions of modernity. I think maybe that's it. You know, how art pushes this forward and how art also reacts to this. It's all fascinating to me. And I think it's really cool. I think the Empire State Building is freaking cool. I love skyscrapers. That's a thing you probably don't know about me. I have a fascination with skyscrapers. Really, really, really like them. But I don't love the new ones. I think they're doing cool stuff in the Middle East. I think they're building interesting looking buildings in China. A lot of what we're building around here is just endless glass condominium buildings that all look the same. And I don't see a lot of inspiration or ambition in a lot of them. Whereas you look back at the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building with its really interesting spire on top with those sort of curved designs and the triangle windows. This is vintage Art Deco. Look at the Chrysler building. The very top, there are a series, it's a design feature, a series of curved, I don't know, what do you call them? Arches, I guess. A series of them. And at the top, there's this section which is triangle windows, geometric shapes, symmetrical, stylized, streamlined. That is Art Deco. And I just think it's really cool. And I think it's so ambitious. To even think about building something like that, knowing what they knew and having what they had at the time, to me is freaking fascinating. And I find these buildings fascinating. And I find the interiors fascinating. And so ambitious. And I look around and I think, are we building anything like that anymore? Do we care? Is there a point of pride anymore in building something like that? Or are we just about function? You know, this is another part of Art Deco as well. And I think of Art Nouveau in terms of architecture, is that form should follow function. I don't really know what that means, but it had to do with a functionality to this building. And it should represent what it does, or it should make it easy to do whatever it does. I don't know. But are we just function now? Do we build beautiful buildings anymore, at least in North America? I don't know if we do. I haven't looked too closely into the modern ones, because all the new stuff's happening in the Middle East, in Asia, you know? The Burj Khalifa and the Petronas Towers and all that stuff, which are very different from Art Deco. But maybe there's, I mean, there's certainly an ambition of height there. <laughs> That's a game they were playing in the 30s. You know, one of the reasons the Empire State Building is as tall as it is, is so it could be taller than the Chrysler Building or whatever. You know, it's got to be the tallest. And that sort of, you know, read into it what phallic things you want to read into it. That was happening then, it's happening now. I just find those buildings freaking cool. And I don't know if we have the same sort of design ambition anymore. I don't know if we do or not. I could be wrong. If you disagree with me, by all means, let me know. I'm going to stop talking now, and I don't even know. I don't even know if I covered this properly. I don't know. It's such a huge, amorphous, not easily defined topic. But I find it fascinating, and I hope you have too. I'll very quickly do the Patreon plug. I don't have the energy to do the whole Patreon plug. There is a Patreon page for this podcast. It is patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast, where 
For the one tier membership price of $5 a month, you can support the show. Think of it as tipping me a buck 25 for every episode I do. I do not want to run ads on this program, and so I have chosen Patreon as a method of monetization because it's voluntary. You know, you don't have to sit through me or fast forward through me doing ad reads or having ads sort of crammed down your throat. We get enough freaking ads, man. Incidentally, advertisements were also done in the Art Deco style. Again, streamlined, stylized, you know, movie posters, travel posters. It was everywhere. This ethos, this ideas about color and movement, Art Deco, it was everywhere. What was I talking about? Patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast. Thank you so much for the people who have signed up for that already. Please do consider it. If you're not into Patreon, that's cool. The podcast will remain free and accessible where you enjoy fine podcasts. You can help me by sharing the episodes, telling your friends, ratings and reviews. Please do consider leaving me a rating and review on your preferred podcast platform, preferably a positive one. Instagram, John Huff Podcast, TikTok for now, John Huff Podcast, Facebook, John Huff Podcast, sign up, share the episodes, tell your friends, ratings and reviews. I appreciate you listening. I hope you've made it this far. I hope you have, if not some understanding of what Art Nouveau and what Art Deco are or were, at least some interest so you can actually go and find out for real, because <laughs> I don't know if I've done any justice here. I just pleased that I made it this freaking far because I've been up to my eyeballs in this stuff for four or five freaking days trying to sort out what it all is, you know? Take a look around. You're in a big city. Take a look for a concrete building that has just this symmetry in its windows, geometric shapes and designs, not a lot of ornamentation, all right? Maybe a bit of inlaid sculpture, stylized, straight lines, angles, triangles. Take a look at it, then look up when it was built. Chances are very good. It's an Art Deco structure. And you'll see it everywhere. And then go into the lobby and look at the floor. You'll probably find a zigzag. I'm going to go. Thanks for coming this far. I, uh, I don't know if I can do this again. <laughs> I don't know if I can do such a loosely defined historical episode again. We call it superficial, and it most certainly was even though it took a freaking hour, I thank you for listening. Have yourselves a fine, fine week. Go listen to the first Darkness album, Permission to Land. I'm plugging that one again. Enjoy it. Drop me a line. I hope you're well. And hey, I'll check you later. Yeah. I got nothing else to freaking say, man. There's nothing to sing here. Maybe New York, New York. I can't even pull up the mind, man. This one was exhausting.